Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome all of you here with us. Thank you for coming. I want to introduce people out there that you may have met over the internet. I welcome people that are join in, joining us over the internet. We're streaming this lecture live uh, across the world. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome to that global audience as well. Our presenter today, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. David Karina. The two of us have been working together what seems like forever, but with the VL2 Way back when, when VL2 first started in 2005, David joined a, a specific meeting, which was the, the initiation of our center. With the, and has, David has been with the VL2 team ever since. You may not know that David is an alumni of Gallaudet University. He got his master's in linguistics here back in the day. I won't say what year that was. And he's got his PhD from the University of California, San Diego. And David has done work with Ursula Belugi and a lot of other people whose names you will recognize in this presentation today. David is a professor at the University of, San uh, University of California, Davis. He does a lot of work on uh, brain imaging and a lot of work with uh, VL2 and uh, a lot of different projects that we are working on. Studies through internet surveys of ASL, behavioral studies of cognitive uh, awareness of language, brain studies of ASL. And so he's going to talk about his research with us today. And just one more thing, if I could say, um, oh, that the welcome, David. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I always enjoy coming back to Gallaudet. It's been a little while. I do come to the campus frequently, but I haven't been to this room in quite a while, and it's nice to see the changes that have occurred since the last time I was here. It's really beautiful. So where should I start? I should start by saying that I was actually supposed to come and give this lecture last year, but that lecture was postponed because you guys were having Snowmageddon. And so this year, I feel like I still have a competing catastrophe, if you will, that we have um, the crisis in Egypt going on, and um, that is something that I am very concerned about. Um, and I would like to thank each and every one of you in the audience for being here today. The theme of my presentation today is one that centers around a problem around ASL that s may seem very simple, but is one that is rather complex. It has to do with how people understand discourse, sentences, how people read, how people translate between languages. And it comes, you could even say, how do people understand just one sign? What is it that is going on cognitively when people perceive single signs or streams of signs or text. I'd like to start by thanking several people that have supported me in doing this research over the years. Some of the people listed here are deaf, some are hearing, some are senior mentors who I have looked up to throughout my career. This is a very basic question. How do we map the physical form of a sign onto a person's cognitive representation of that sign's meaning? So what is happening in the brain when we translate what we've perceived into our understanding of what that sign means? 
And there are actually two challenges in trying to answer that question. One is whether signs are recognized in a qualitatively different way than the way in which we recognize other forms of human action. And the second challenge is what sorts of mental representations are needed to perform such linguistic mapping. I'll start by addressing the first question. So are signs recognized in a manner that's different than how we recognize other forms of human action? I'll start with an example by taking a sip of water from this bottle. I just performed a human action. Most of the people in this room can clearly recognize what I, clearly recognize what I did. I picked up the bottle, I opened it, took a sip from it, closed it, and put it down. Is how you perceived that action different than how you perceive me signing someone taking a bottle, taking a drink of water from a bottle? So that's the distinction between human action and ASL. We can see that, that it looks different, but what happens in the brain when they perceive those two different things? The literature does have good evidence that the ways in which we process sign language are different than the ways in which we process perception of human action. However, there is some overlap. I'll show a few research studies that have given us this evidence for the fact that signs are recognized differently than how we recognize human action. So we can confidently answer the first question by saying yes, we do have good evidence for saying that signs are recognized differently than human action. The second question, however, is not as clear cut. In some of my research, I've now come to think that perhaps we've been looking in the wrong direction, and this is why we are not necessarily able to answer that second question. I'll go into this further later in the presentation. Now, why is it important to even understand the, qu the answer to the questions that we're posing? One is that understanding the nature of human language in all of its forms, be they spoken or signed, and understanding the ways in which languages are similar and different, and how human communication is different than other forms of communication that may exist among animals, helps us understand the broader question of what is human language. Another reason that this sort of work is important is because it can help us develop remediation for people who have impairments around language production. People that use spoken languages have these sorts of impairments, and people who use signed languages have these sorts of impairments. And so it's important for us to have a basic understanding of how language works in order for us to understand how people that have these sorts of issues might be able to be helped. And finally, it's important for us to understand how different language forms are mapped onto each other, which we can only start to understand when we know more about human language. So what might seem like a very simple question, which is how do we recognize a sign, is actually very complex because of the implications that it has. Going back to the two challenges, and looking at the first challenge around sign recognition and recognition of other forms of human action, I'll show you what some of this evidence is for being able to say that signs are recognized differently. When we as people 
look at the world around us, we see different forms of human action. Facial expressions, gestures, movements, we see and hear speech. So how is it that we make sense of these multiple forms and is sign different than how we recognize some of these other forms? I'll show evidence from five different types of studies. The first of which is a developmental study. The second is a study that used what we call PET imaging. The third uses event-related electronic potentials, which I'll refer to as ERPs. The fourth study uses MEG technology, which is another form of mental imaging. And the fifth comes from a study of aphasics. And all of these studies investigated whether or not sign is separate from understanding human action. We'll start with information about the developmental study. Language researchers have shown that young infants show an inherent interest in speech. And so it seems that from the first moments of life, children are ready to acquire language. And for many years, language researchers have shown at younger and younger ages that children prefer listening to speech than other forms of auditory input, be they sounds made from a computer, music, or what have you. Children seem more interested in language when they're presented with an option of listening to language or some other sound. Many people have interpreted these findings as proof that children have a propensity, propensity for favoring speech. But we could argue that that conclusion is really based on the fact that only spoken languages had been studied. And so we don't know whether children show that preference for language or for speech. So some studies have addressed this problem. And so again, this study comes from the fact that the literature shows that children have been interested in speech at very young ages, but we cannot parse out whether that interest is in speech itself or in language. To look further at this, one of my students with the last name Krenz at the University of Washington tried to answer the question of whether six-month-olds would show a preference for looking at one video of someone using ASL or a video of pantomime. These six-month-old six-month-olds would be able to look at both videos at the same time and we wanted to know if they would show a preference for looking at one video or another. This sort of study is called a preferential looking paradigm. There were two groups of participants, one of which was six-month-olds and the other was 10-month-olds. We chose these ages because of what previous literature has shown. Literature has shown that at the age of six months, infants are still interested in a very wide variety of languages, but by 10 months, children show a preference for their mother tongue or native language. This is what the research setup looks like. There are two television monitors displaying two different videos, one of which has sign language and the other has gesture. A mother would hold her infant and we have a camera mounted to the child's head so that we can monitor which screen the child's looking at. And then we count how often the child looks at each monitor and we look at how long they're looking at each monitor. The people in the videos signing 
and doing the pantomimes are the same person. And we see here a very cute baby looking off to her, his or her right, which means that he or she is looking either at the ASL or the pantomime. Here are the results. On the left, you see the times for six-month-olds. And you see a significant difference in the amount of time that they're looking at the ASL versus the pantomime. And we see that they are showing a statistically significant difference between these two, th and they're preferring watching ASL over watching mime. What this tells us then is that children have more of an interest in language. But by 10 months, we are not seeing a difference in how much or how long children are looking at ASL versus mime. And this is similar to what we see with other languages because at 10 months of age, children are showing a preference for their own native language. So this still supports what we have found already in the spoken language literature, which is that children seem to have an interest in language in general, not the modality. So it seems that from the very beginning, young children have an appreciation of the differences between the differences between a formal language and gesture. So even though children who have not been exposed to sign language are watching sign language and mime, somehow they're sensitive to the difference between ASL and mime because of the linguistic difference. This also tells us that children are likely not focusing on speech, but they're focusing on language in general, which then does tell us that children are born with the inherent ability and desire to acquire some language regardless of modality. And at six months, children show that preference. By 10 months, they lose that preference but again, this is very similar to what we have found with spoken language research. A future question that this could take us to is then how does early language experience change the brain in terms of their preference for language versus non-language? And I'll leave that for another researcher to do at some point. Now I'll turn to some adult research. I showed you earlier the difference between this, a human action, taking a drink of water from a bottle, and the difference between signing a person taking a drink from a bottle. We want to know what's going on in the brain when a deaf signing adult looks at a human action versus someone signing that human action. This study used PET technology, which lets us look at blood flow in the brain. And when certain parts of your brain are working harder, blood concentrates in that part of the brain. And so that's how PET technology lets us know what parts of the brain are working. And this fluid is slightly radioactive and it lets us track where the blood goes in the brain so that we can see what areas of the brain are being activated. This is a comparative study It looked at 10 native deaf signers and 10 hearing non-signers watching a series of brief hand movements of one form or another. One group 
of these movements are called self-directed actions. And more often than not, these actions were self-grooming behaviors. Whether you're tugging at your shirt, scratching your head, these are the sorts of movements that you see on a daily basis, but they don't have much relevance. There's no objects involved. Another category of things that the participants would watch are object-directed actions, which, again, daily sorts of actions, but that now involve objects. Third category of things people would look at are ASL signs, and these were single signs, not signs that were a part of sentences. And the fourth thing they would look at is a blurred out video that is considered a baseline, which is a requirement so that we have a baseline for their normal blood flow when they're not looking at anything. What we found is the following. When hearing people and deaf people look at these self-directed, self-grooming behaviors, whether it's cracking your knuckles or scratching your head, we see some differences. The image of the brain on the top that you see is that of a hearing non-signer. On the bottom is of a deaf signer. What we see on the top is that for hearing non-signers, you see a lot of activation in the prefrontal cortex, which is the pre-motor area. We also see activation on the left side of the brain, which is here, which is in in a pericortex. And that sort of action has been reported several times. Some people have called this system a mirror neuron system. And this is a something that you see when people watch other people doing a simple action or task. When deaf people watch these same sorts of things, their mirror system looks quite different. Their activation, they still do have some activation in the parietal cortex, like hearing non-signers, but where we see a difference is in this area here. This activates what we call the ventral temporal system, which is the lower region of your brain. And this was interesting and unexpected. We did not expect to see a difference between hearing non-signers and deaf signers when they watch this, but it's very clear that there is a difference. Next, we'll look at results when people were looking at object direction act directed actions. We still see parietal activation in hearing non-signers, which is what we would expect based on what we know of that mirror neural system. For deaf signers, we still see activation in the parietal cortex, but again, we're seeing lots of ventral activity or activation. And I'd like we'd like to know more about why this part of the brain is being activated. This is a direct comparison of how a deaf signing subject perceives ASL versus a non-linguistic gest gesture. This part of the brain that I just pointed out is Broca's area. The left side of your brain is on this part of the slide, which is Wernicke's area. And these are two areas of the brain that are well known to be recruited in language production and comprehension. The parts of the brain shaded in green are ventral portions and uh, excuse me are in ventral areas of the brain and are often used when perceiving human action and this lists what I just mentioned 
language areas are in red. And so again, that involves Broca's area, and which is in the STS. And then the ventral activation has to do with a system that seems to often be involved in processing human forms. Researchers have found that activation, for uh, exact example, when we're looking at parts of the body, activate this part of the brain. So it seems that this part of the brain is used when looking at the human form. So one theory is that it may be important for deaf signers to develop a sensitivity to detect action that are actions that are linguistic versus non-linguistic. And that may be why we see this activation in the ventral areas of the brain. So this activation may reflect the sensitivity for identifying the human form that deaf people have developed simply by watching the world. So again, we see a clear difference in how people process ASL versus how they process human actions. And some people could look at these results and perhaps say that deaf people are paying attention to different things than hearing subjects. And that is one possible interpretation of the study. However, it is again clear that at least there is a difference. Now, so far, we've been talking about recognition of human action during tests where they're looking either at human actions or signs. So another question that we could ask is, what is happening while you're watching sign language when you see a non-linguistic action? Here's an example sentence, which I will now sign. Did anyone notice something about that? I said, thank you for inviting me here today, but at some point in that sentence, I also scratched my face. Now, that wasn't linguistic information. Scratching my face wasn't ASL. So how is it that people who know sign language are able to monitor sign language and not be distracted by the insertion of a human movement? To look at this question, we looked at event-related potentials, which also looks at brain activity by monitoring electronic actions that are in the brain. ERP technology is sensitive to measuring electrodes that are on your scalp. Because we know that neurons just below um, the surface are firing and giving off electrical activity. And so simply by measuring this electrical activity at the surface of the brain, we can get a sense of where neurons are firing in your brain. And so this is ERP technology, and this is most often viewed as a printout of lines on a screen, similar to what you might see um, like with a heart rate monitor. Now what we do with the results is that we average the signal so for example, we've got some sort of sound generator 
we have um, an electrode that is um, placed on the person's scalp that is then amplified, or the output is then amplified on an EEG, and then we average how many trials occur in order to find the ERP. Excuse me, the ERP waveform. Now these potentials are the waveforms that you see that look much more smooth than you saw in the EEG output. And they reflect activity of neuronal activity at different levels. Through many years of research, people have found that some points on this wave are connected to parts of the body. So for example, the point you see here labeled as N1 often has to do with attention. So when someone startles you or gets your attention, you'll see a peak at N1 and then N400 and N600 often have to do with language processing. N400 is actually the negative part of the wave, and that means that you're reacting about 400 milliseconds after you have perceived a word. I'll continue to talk more about this in the next few slides. There's a very well-known effect of what happens at N400. Someone would listen to a sentence such as, I like coffee with milk and sugar. The brain activity when someone listens to this sentence is reflected here in blue. You could also hear a sentence like, I like coffee with milk and socks. And obviously, there's something unexpected in that sentence. You don't expect to hear the word socks. And this is reflected with the broken red line. And you see a difference here between the blue line and red line at N400. And this shows how easy it is to represent ongoing semantic representations. So when everything's making sense, things fit, your semantic representations and your expectations, but if something goes awry and it's not what you expected, then you'll see a disruption of the ERP waveform at N400. So by using this technology, we can see what happens when people watch someone signing and do something that is non-linguistic, such as scratch their face. In this study, we used four different sentence types. And I'll give you an example of each sentence type. First, we have an ASL gloss, boy sleep in his bed, which is fairly typical. It's what you'd expect. Then we have boy sleep in his lemon. We see that lemon is not semantically what you would expect. And so we should expect to see a difference in the ERP waveform at N400. Another sentence type is boy sleep in his, and then insertion of a non-sign. That would also be hard to incorporate into one semantic representation. It would not be what you expect, so you should again see a disruption in the ERP waveform. And then the fourth type of stimuli that a participant would see is boy sleep in his, and then the person would scratch their face and conclude with a different sign. So with this, we'd like to see what people are doing when they're watching someone scratching their face. This is another representation of what I've just explained. Boy, sleep, in his, and then at the very end, we have four different signs. Either bed, lemon, a non-sign, or scratching his or her face. We came up with 40 different sentences for each of those four 
conditions. So this created a lot of sentences, and it meant that the task would be rather long. And it's because we needed enough stimuli to create a robust average for each of those conditions. Now, I've shown in the data that the negative part of the bar, uh, of the graph, is actually above. Actually, I'm sorry, I should say that in reverse. The top half is positive and the bottom half is negative. So when you're watching a sign and you see something that you expect, that's represented with the blue line. So for example, the boy sleep in his bed. And then the semantically odd sign, so for example, boy sleep in his lemon, is represented by the red line. And you see um, a drop again at N400. And then for a nonce sign, like boy sleep in his some made up sign, you see um, a further negative movement of that line. But what we see very interestingly is that when that sentence is concluded with something like scratching someone's face, that wave moves in the positive direction. We didn't expect that for that condition. But what this tells us is that the brain very quickly rejects this non-linguistic movement of a person scratching their face. And they're doing that, the brain is doing that, within 400 milliseconds of seeing that sign. The brain knows right away not to pay attention to that movement because it's not part of a language system. Again, this provides further evidence for showing that how we process sign language and how we process human action cognitively is different. The brain is very sensitive to these two things. These points on the cap that this person is wearing, each can measure a, the activity of electrodes. And so one of those electrodes represents, oh, excuse me, measures activity that is represented in these graphs. And so what we see is that there is a very strong pattern of non-linguistic movement, such as scratching the face, being very quickly rejected by the brain. So the data that we have from ERP studies, again, is that the brain quickly rejects the non-linguistic gesture. And this does not provide evidence that there is even an attempt to integrate this non-linguistic movement into a linguistic representation, which is further very clear evidence for difference in our systems of when we process language versus when we process human actions. This study was recently concluded with the uh, help of oh, someone who's in the audience today. Thank you very much for your help. This was an MEG study. MEG stands for Magnetoencephalography, which is basically a very similar technique to ERPs, however, it uses magnetic, it measures magnetic activity versus electrical activity. 
And of course, there is a relationship between magnetic and electrical activity. But this lets us pick up on different information in the brain, magnetic information. And the advantage that MEG technology gives us is that we can look at, we have a lot more information about the temporal representation of things and how long time, how much time people take to process things. At this point of the wave, this is time zero, time 100 milliseconds, and then time 200 milliseconds. So there's greater temporal resolution in the information that we get from MEG technology. This study looked at language processing, but specifically whether we develop a certain picture of the linguistic system. If you look at this slide, you see two images, and it seems as if both are signs. But do you notice anything unusual about the picture on the right? This picture is actually impossible. The hand has been switched so that there is a left hand on the right arm of this gentleman's body. So this is biologically impossible, which means that it's also an implausible sign. We did this using Photoshop. So we had a lot of fun playing around with different images and making them biologically impossible. Some of the stimuli that we used are pictures of actual signs, and some are stimuli that are of plausible signs that have been um, modified so that they are physically impossible to produce. This bar graph shows the reaction time. So basically how long it takes someone to decide whether the picture that they're seeing is possible or not. And what this tells us is that deaf people have a far faster reaction time than hearing non-signers do. And this was not surprising. And we see that deaf people's sensitivity levels are at D prime which means that deaf people have a greater sensitivity to detect the human form than hearing non-signers do. And this may be because deaf people's experience with sign language has enabled them to identify the human form much more rapidly. This is the MEG signal here on the slide. You can see very obvious differences between the results from deaf participants and hearing participants. For the deaf participants, there are two parts that seem statistically different from hearing people. One is the earlier time, which we call M100, and then M130, which is just 30 milliseconds after they've seen the picture. So this is extremely fast. They're recognizing um, these images very quickly. So the brain is noticing that difference. But hearing people are not showing that same sensitivity in the MEG. And this is a fairly complex representation that's intended to show another difference between the performance of deaf individuals and hearing individuals. There is activation at only two areas in the brain that seem to lead people to have this sensitivity. For hearing people, we see an activation in the same area, but much lighter. It's not as strong. The lower part of the, gra of the picture is showing the reaction in a deaf signer's brain at M130, and we're barely seeing that level of activation in hearing non-signers. So in looking at the data at M100, we are interpreting this as possibly being related to attention, that perhaps deaf people 
are more able to pay attention to visual information, and that's why they catch it earlier at N100. And so it's interesting to think about what might influence these effects and to see how it might be that your experience with a visual language influences cognitive processing in ways that are different than hearing non-signers. This is a summary slide for the MEG data, which again has told us that deaf subjects are better at discriminating biologically impossible forms. The data also suggests differences in attention and in neural population that support um, these differences or these enhancements. And from this data, we could say that language experience may have contributed to these enhancements in the perception of human forms. So far, we've looked at a developmental study, a PET study, an ERP study, and an MEG study. Finally, I'd like to look at what we know from looking at deaf people who have aphasia. Often after someone has had a stroke, they suffer language impairments. And this is true whether you are a sign language user or a user of a spoken language because of the way in which a stroke affects your left hemisphere. A case study was done that has been referenced and reported many times because of the interesting patterns that have been found with this deaf aphasic. This is a, d a deaf gentleman who uh, has a deaf brother, whose wife was deaf, and who um, at 70 si before 76 years of age suffered a stroke. Now, the sort of stroke that he suffered in hearing people, the sort of stroke that he suffered caused him to have brain damage that ca would cause aphasia in hearing people that would lead to poor production and comprehension of language. So we should see the same sort of language impairment with sign language. But what's interesting is that this gentleman was still able to use pantomime in order to communicate. So his ability to communicate was preserved even though his language was disrupted. One study that we conducted with this gentleman involved showing him different objects, such as uh, something even as simple as a ball. And when we asked him what it was, he wouldn't sign it in ASL, but instead he would mime what you do with the ball. So he mimed bouncing. When we showed him a picture of an airplane, he wouldn't sign airplane, but he would mime what it means to fly. So again, his signing was impaired, but his ability to communicate and gesture was not. Now, despite the fact that his language was impaired, there are certain aspects of ASL that were preserved in his language. He did not perform well on ASL comprehension either. But if we pantomimed, he could comprehend pantomime just fine. So if we gestured someone using a gun versus actually signing a gun, he could understand the pantomime better than he could the formal language. So what we see from this case study is that the impairment really does affect the language itself and not the form. Now, because this is a case study, some people might say that it's not sufficient evidence. But this study was replicated with other signed languages, French Sign Language and British Sign Language. And the data from these studies have also shown that the aphasics that they studied preserved the ability to mime, but their language was disturbed. So again, what we see from these studies is that disturbed sign language productions, but intact ability to understand and use pantomime 
show that there's a difference in how we recognize human action versus language. Going back now to our initial two challenges, we've looked at whether signs are recognized in a qualitatively different manner than other forms of human action. I've talked about five types of studies that were done, developmental, that gave us developmental data, data from PET studies, MEG studies, ERP studies, and aphasia studies, all of which indicate that the processing of signs are dependent on specialized and dissociable neural systems. I'll turn now to the second challenge. What are the thought representations that you need to understand a sign versus a human action? What mind representations are needed to perform this linguistic mapping? This has been a much harder question to answer over the last many years, we have been guided by a specific theory that was based in spoken language research. And we're trying to do comparative studies with spoken language and sign language. Spoken language would suggest that perhaps we are not using a correct approach when we use those paradigms. Backing up just a bit, looking at the traditional view. spoken language processing, what is it that the mind is representing? What we talk about acoustic forms and analyzing that for their features. Most often, we look at phonemes. And speech is then decomposed and we look at how the mind uh, can map these mental representations. For years, many people have felt the same about signs. So this is just representing what I've just said. Person speaks, there is an acoustic waveform, this is a spectral analysis of that, then it's broken down into features and phonemes, which then are uh, reconstructed to perform, uh, to make words, and then leads to that understanding. This is a very characteristic view of spoken language. Most uh, sign language psycholinguists psycholinguist have a different view, which I will show you now. The belief has been the same, that we take an image and decompose it. So if we take a sign, there's a special relationship here as the signer's body as opposed to the arm that's reaching out and the movement are aspects that we have been looking at. Linguistic theory says that we have four parameters of a sign, hand shape, location, movement, and orientation. But however, the way we have been parsing this out, decomposing and reconstructing, is a way of understanding a sign. So that follows a traditional view of spoken language research and theory. I'm suggesting perhaps that's not the right way to look at this. And this gets to the tricky question for several reasons. First of all, there's a difference between production and comprehension. For production reasons, I would say yes, there's good evidence for breaking down the signs the way we have traditionally clearly there are distinctions between you know there's a problem with hand shape or location they're easily identifiable but comprehension how we parse that out perhaps we should look at it differently so This is a representation of this of the sign for idea. So there's location, movement, and location. HC is the a, a hand configuration, and then uh, 
So this is how we sort of separate and decompose the sign of idea. This has been the belief that this is actually what is represented in your mind, what your mind represents, is looking at these different elements of how you break down the sign. I'm not convinced that this is what your brain is doing when you're comprehending a sign. There's a difference between production and comprehension, again, as I've said. It's not clear to me that trying to comprehend a sign is broken down uh, in parts the same way it is when we are producing. We have clear evidence for producing a sign and how that is looked at. Like, for example, with aphasias, or aphasic patients, you see the differences um, with errors, with hand shape and location. However, uh, there are not s there's not so much data from comprehension studies. The data is not as convincing. This is from the same study of this gentleman, W.L. And let me give you an example of something that he signs. So the hand shape tends to be um, distorted. So for example, like the sign for sister, he signs it with an F hand shape. It's not a sign. It's clearly a mistake. What happened to WL was maybe six months before the stroke, the National, National Association of the Deaf went and interviewed him for a lifetime achievement for the Living History Project. That was six months before the stroke. And you could see clearly that he signed sister. He would never sign sister with F handshapes. But after, there were mistakes with handshapes. Brushing your teeth, he would do with a Y handshape. Screwdriver, he'd do with his thumb. Instead of saying fine, with, he would use a Y hand shape again. Instead of white, he'd sign it this way with two hands. So these errors seem to clearly indicate that in his production there are specific problems with hand shape. So that's a good example of the decomposition. That there's different parts of a sign that's pretty clear. But the question is when we talk about comprehending, we're looking about hand, do we really look at hand shape, location, and movement as helping us to comprehend a sign? There's also another study. This gets pretty technical, but sometimes a, a person that has uh, sort of surgery f because of epilepsy. They may rem remove part of the brain that causes those seizures. And so this person happened to be deaf. A deaf person with epilepsy, during surgery, electrodes were put on different, uh, to, to map different parts of the brain to see where the language was to avoid those sections of the brain that process language. And we, they would map specific areas where language was not. So these electrodes in the specific area causes mistakes with hand shapes. Again, with production, it's very clear that we do have this decomposition. As well as we've also uh, heard, you know, the tip of the finger, as we call it. Like if you can't, you can't think of a sign, it's right. You almost got it, but you can't quite think of what the sign is. So people don't think of handshape right away. It's, um, what we see is um, parsings uh, of the sign. But, but my point is to clearly understand, the, uh, to, to comprehend a sign. Do we really look 
at the hand shapes, the way that we have traditionally looked at them, or other parameters of ASL. All of these are non-signs, but the movement is the same. These are frozen forms of the picture, but the idea is we ask people, what do signs most look alike? And this is a judgment of rhyming in ASL. So what are the shared parameters of rhyme in ASL? Sometimes you have signs that have the same movement and orientation. So for example, the location is the same, the hand shapes are different. Or a different location, same movement and same hand shape. A third example, I'm trying to remember. Um, so same hand shape, same location, different movement. So these are three different possibilities and we ask um, people to identify which is most alike. Native signers, uh, here it shows that they have the same location and movement, that that's the most similar as it has been identified. The other options are um, a little bit less here, but the native signers also or, or the non-native signers also identify these similarities the same as native signers. Location and movement seem to be the most important and that is indication of rhyme in ASL, but is that a linguistic effect or is that, or is that a visual effect and how do you test for that? So with hearing non-signers, we pick two signs that they would still select the two signs that look most similar using the same parameters. Location and movement. That, that's, that, those two parameters were used most often to identify similar signs. So it's a rhyme. It may not be linguistic as much as it has a visual effect that's being identified. But it's very tricky to figure out uh, the decomposing of a sign based on this. Another study using uh, ERP, study of rhyming, in ASL. Again, looking at N400 as in on the timeline to see the different activity we see here with N450, for non-rhyming signs, there's uh, the difference is identified, so it is a, a bigger negative effect when the signs are don't rhyme, when they're non-rhyming. So for deaf and hearing signers, if we say to them, tell us if, if this is the same or different with location and movement, then they'll focus on those, they'll use that focus for their analysis. When the two signs were different at N450 is where we saw a greater difference. And this is the traditional rhyme effect that we see in spoken language uh, research as well. That's with the deaf signers. But hearing non-signers also uh, show an indication at N450. Even though it's smaller, the first half of the trials, there wasn't much up until like, point 0.80. But we did see uh, where it shows up at N450 for 
hearing non-signers in the trial. So location and movement do have a strong visual effect. So perhaps it's not linguistic in and of itself. So we have to do some more testing to check to see if it's actually a linguistic property or is it just a perceptual property. So with the rhyme judgment, deaf and hearing non-signers performed almost the same. And it's a similar finding um, for the similarity rating with hearing and deaf uh, non-signers. had the same effect. So the question is, are we really assessing linguistic or perceptual representations? Some suggest it, it is a linguistic effect that influences comprehension. I'm sorry, let me back up just a moment. I'd like to mention one other study as well. One question is, why is it important? What is the reason for that internal representation of a sign or a word? What does it support? One theory suggests that representation is very important for understanding variation with acoustics. Like if I hear uh, a young girl's speech and I s see a speech form So for example, a young child could say something and an adult could say something. And if I were to represent their speech on a graph, the acoustic signal would look very different. But as a listener, you're still able to know when this young person and this old person are saying the same word. So even though there's a great deal of variety in speech production of what you might hear, what we do is end up mapping it to our lexicon. So this is how we deal with the invariance problem in language. What we'd like to look at is whether or not this happens for ASL. And if people can still understand the two different forms of a sign that might be produced by um, different people or might be produced in different ways or at different angles. So what we did was manipulate the angle at which you're watching a person producing the same sign. So you see a sign that's the prime, and you either answer, yes, it's a sign, or no, it is not a sign, this sign here, and you hit yes. And then the next prime comes up again with the same sign at a different angle, or at the same angle. And so the second time, you have a faster response because you've just previously seen the prime. So if I do this, you're watching this, and then I turn, and I do this, is that the same as doing this, and then the same sign again? Some will argue that our ability to be sensitive to that rotation is further evidence for an internal representation of the sign. So the question is, do we have this representation or not? Again, with the effects of rotation, testing hearing, deaf and hearing non-signers, deaf people are much faster than hearing people, clearly faster. But what we do see here is a very similar pattern. What I had expected was if a deaf person see, saw this or this, they would have the same reaction time as opposed to having it uh, not rotated. So it surprised me to have these findings. Again, I don't have 
an answer. But this kind of research suggests to me that perhaps there's an internal representation of the sign that's different from spoken language representations. So decomposition, is it required for comprehension? Similarity judgments from those trials, what we see is that it could be influenced by either language or it's the visual nature, or the rhyming tasks. Um, we see the same thing with the perceptual variance study. Again, does it get to the non-linguistic versus linguistic aspects of this? And don't get me wrong, I mean, part of it, you can show cases where the linguistic knowledge is important. I'm just going to talk about this a little bit more and then we'll wrap it up. So another test we used was um, recognizing handshape. Watching people sign and non-signs and anytime you s would see uh, a marked handshape you need to respond in a specific way. Again, this is used in spoken languages as well, uh, with marked and unmarked. So we're just monitoring if they see a handshape. So if we take the sign for father and another two-handed sign like this for deer, it's the same handshape, location, and movement. And then the third one would be something different like fail or one week. And the non-dominant hand shape is the hand shape they're supposed to be looking for, but they don't notice it because they're watching the dominant hand. These are one-handed signs, two-handed signs with the same hand shape. And we do see a parallel with hearing and non-hearing signers or non or hearing non-signers. But on, the, on the, th the, th the third type of sign, the two-handed sign, hearing people have uh, are much slower at recognizing that. And it has to do with ASL phonetics. That there's a if you have specific knowledge of that sign language, you can then recognize the hand shapes represented in a different way. So the form of res representation doesn't necessarily parse the signs in the same way that we had thought. And this is evidence for whole sign representations. So in conclusion, Sign recognition is very different between language action and sign language. The second question about the sublexical level, if there's a difference with the perceptual effects, I think what's been most reported in psycholinguistic literature and sign languages is um, visual effects versus language effects. And I think we need more research in that area. Again, based on this and other data, no, but I wasn't able, to, because of time limitations, show you today, that the fluency of sign language comprehension relies on the whole form, that people do not parse out looking at language for comprehension the same way that we have shown it to be. And the differences between sign languages and spoken languages um, show a different view of how people look at that. This difference might be because of modality and because of how what your world experience has been like when you sign or don't sign and you're deaf or, or hearing. What we have seen is um, 
a box that has been designed or a paradigm that has been designed for a way of looking at signed languages that um, has been set up from spoken language research. So here we're showing a clear distinction and that we may need to take a different view of how we look at this to advance our understanding of how we understand signs. That's all I got. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. My question is rather short, but I think it's going to require a long answer. It seems you're suggesting that what we use for our perceptual and productive systems are different. But um, you drew on tip of the finger data as well as other data for production issues. But so you're saying that when I produce a sign that I am actively picking different parameters in order to produce that sign. But then when I'm understanding, when I'm perceiving, I'm just drawing, tapping straight into the lexicon. I'm just sort of wondering, I mean, I understand that the perceptual system and production system are different, but are they that different that you could say that they rely on two completely different systems and processes? It's a very good question, and it's not an easy question. In research, we have seen that there are lexicons. Uh, there's not a separate one for, under for comprehension and production. And from aphasic uh, patients, we see that their comprehension is preserved even though they can't produce um, a sign the same way. So there must be a division. It may be different depending on the language, uh, how much the language is overlapped or how much it is separate. I can't say at this point yes or no, but research can help us further figure out you know, these two different lexicons, one for comprehending and one for production. I've always felt that we've kind of, uh, comprehension is going, working backwards to production. So, uh, or it's sort of a, a reverse process. So this the same process going in reverse. That's been the belief, and I'm not convinced that's, uh, that's the right way to go. It's interesting, but uh, the focus on sign language perhaps can give us an understanding of different findings, which will then lead to um, new findings in spoken language research as well. Another example. Uh, people at the Haskins lab, their view of speech is that they said it's based on specific parts and that there is gestural forms that perhaps are perceived as a whole, but you don't look, you don't perceive it, the individual parts. So the same thing may be happening in ASL as well. Thank you for the question. Hi, my name is Gabriel, and I'm, I'd like to go back to the slide where you mentioned um, studies that were done in ASL, French Sign Language, and British Sign Language. Were you involved in the work on FSL and BSL? No, I wasn't. I just was citing them. Okay. I ask because um, of just the population of sign language users that we have of ASL can be quite a bit varied versus um, that what we'll see from French Sign Language and British Sign Language users because of the size of the US. And I imagine people on different coasts could end up sort of thinking in different ways. And so I wonder if um, the people who participated in your study were from a particular region of the US? Well, the study of um, aphasics uh, were from different areas in the United States. Like wherever we could find a person to test, we would go and test them wherever they were in the United States. Interesting. Yes. So we do recognize regional variation. So that's we're trying to be, you know, very clear and very conscious about uh, distinguishing that sensitive issue with regional variation. But in terms of how we measure that, that variation. 
We could use ERP brain waves to see how people recognize that variation with spoken or signed languages. That's possible. Right. I think that goes back to what you were saying about not being confined to that spoken language box. I mean, we could even do something different, not just looking at aphasics, but looking at people who have unimpaired signing and are users of ASL on a daily basis. Right. Mm, in our lab, well, we have students that have uh, different come from different backgrounds. And in ERP studies, we look at sensitivity to accents and dialects, and there is a difference in the ERP. So it's a, it's a very interesting possibility, but we're trying to um, do enough research so that we can make a generalized statement. Thank you, David.